1946, a motion picture projectionist was the highest paid industrial job in California. It used to be one of the best jobs in, in the city. If you're not showing it right, you're not doing it right, you've messed up the film. You've made it a disaster for the filmmaker. In the World War II and the 40s, you had everybody in America going to movies every week. The total number of admissions in 1946 was 140 million people per week, which is approximately the number of people who lived in the United States then. Really, what we're here to see is not the stuff running through the machine, we're here to see Fred Astaire dancing. We're here to uh, listen to the music and to see the performance. As long as we have archives, projectionist is gonna be an important part of that. You know, so far I, I'm still getting enough entertainment out of providing entertainment that I still come in to do it. My uh, name's Steve Abbott. Um, profession is I'm a projectionist. Been a projectionist since 1991. It is an art form to be a projectionist. You know, with projectionists that, you know, they're not the most important, but they're important. You're part of the process to, to show or to exhibit the product, the film. They weren't the actor, they weren't the director, they didn't do the cut, they didn't do, you know, all that stuff. I mean, they spent how many millions of dollars? If you're not showing it right, you're not doing it right, you've messed up the film. You've made it a disaster for the filmmaker. And you're the last line. You're the one that's showing it, you know. You didn't have multiplex houses, you know. It was a single screen house, you know. That was your house and that's, and you ran it the way you were supposed to, you know. That's what I missed of the golden age, I would consider it, you know. My name is Fred Carter. I'm professional, motion picture projectionist. Uh, I've been a projectionist for over 32 or 34 years. I never had been a movie buff. Like some projectionists, they love movies, and when they're not working in theaters, they go see a movie. My name is Lee Sanders. For about 40 years, I've been a motion picture film projectionist. In the 60s, everybody was one kind of a freak or another, and I was a film freak, which was men's. I had no drugs, no rock and roll, no sex, just film. <laughs> I, although that reminds me, I lost a girlfriend at a, four, at a quadruple feature. She couldn't handle it. <laughs> Hi, my name is Paul Rayton. I'm a motion picture projectionist. Mm -hmm. From 1960 to 2013 would be 53 years. I started seeing movies in our small movie theater in town, and I found the projection room door, and I opened it up, and I looked in just to see. So that was my first really look at a projection room in a big theater. And they said, well, you're not authorized to be in here. Get out. So I left. I learned the trade when I was in the Navy at the Naval Hospital in Great Lakes. I had uh, a friend that worked for special service, he asked me that I wanted to uh, go to a projection school and make some extra money and run movies on the base. And I said, yeah, that sounds interesting. Sure. A friend of mine was running the Vagabond Theater, and the projectionist quit. This was a non-union booth. They didn't pay much, and, he, and I didn't care about that. I just, he said, go run the equipment, and I, so I went and did it. Uh, he says, you've seen enough movies. You can run the projectors. <laughs> And I had to actually teach myself in, the, in one night. I became a projectionist starting in high school. I, I, I signed up to the U, U, Audiovisual Aids Club, which was the kids that would help tote the projectors down the hall and set up a glass beaded screen to run, you know, how to bake an egg or something. You know, the educational movies from, from the era. I remember the first night, I didn't know how to frame the film. So I had to be careful to get the film in frame when I was threading it up. And then the next day I actually learned where the frame knob was. Uh, and I, kept, I continue to learn things, you know, on, that's, that's who I am. I somehow met up with people from the College Film Society. Their projectionist was a fellow who'd been in the, in the trenches during World War II. And he was uh, 
uh, mind you, this was, what, 16, 17 years after the end of uh, the shooting war of World War II. And he, and he had some things, you know, from being in combat, you know, and, and, and so he was a little unpredictable. So once in a great while, he'd just go on a bender where he wouldn't make it in to uh, run the show. And so that, you know, I'd get the call to come in and, and run. So I was kind of getting on the job training while I was working with this guy. You know, I learned most of his good habits, but not, not the bad ones, I trust. My first show to run on my own, I got the print. I was doing, uh, checking the print and make sure that it was okay. All the reels on one side of the film was sparkle holes torn. And I said, oh boy, this is not gonna run. Every reel. So I was, I was sweating bullets. So I went down there and told, I went down there and told uh, Special Service, and they say, well, we can't get another print. Run it, see how it goes. And I ran the whole feature, and it just ran perfectly. And that I don't know how that film ran, but I was glad when it was over with. That was quite an experience there. I never will forget that. They are a lot of loners in the business, and uh, they have some odd quirks. I, I think projectionists are people who tend to sort of prefer being isolated or working alone. In the case of projectionists, it was a little bit tough because the hours that are worked are the kind most people are having social engagements in the e early evening. And, and that's one of the downsides of projection is that you're working uh, evenings and weekends, which is when most people have their social life. But you know, some of them have gone to jail for their odd quirks. Uh, one of my favorites, a guy named, what was his name? Uh, well, anyway. Sorry. He would come into the booth uh, wearing a gun and put it down on the workbench. <laughs> and his purpose of that was to keep anyone else from coming into the booth. I think the isolation of projection sometimes works against people. And if they don't have some degree of self-control, uh, they can get into trouble. Uh, another time, I went into someone's booth uh, during a festival because the film was bouncing up and down, had lost its loop, it was a disaster. And I ran up, well, I, I actually I snuck up to the booth and went in there looking at a projector I'd never seen before and trying to figure out what to do. And the projectionist uh, was not grateful. He, he grabbed me by my arm and dragged me out of the booth, dragged me downstairs, and uh, we had uh, at least one or two fights over that, but he eventually became one of my good union brothers. If he was the kind of person that can't be closed up in a room, that's not the type of job for you, man. You know, once you, the machines get to rolling, you have to stay there until, till, until it ends. In the good old days, we had lots of ways of, of um, enhancing the show and, and making it part of a theatrical experience. And of course, that was lost with the advent of the mega multiplex theater, where pretty much all those elements were automated. We could turn handles like this, and we'd operate the show like this, you know, bring up the blue footlights and turning down the uh, green stage lights, and then I'll pull the red here to get the light on the curtain and do this and that. While we're closing the curtain and uh, then opening the curtain and then bring it back and get the show going, so now we just push a button. Always, when I ran those kind of booths that have those uh, light dimmers and the curtains, I give them a performance. I open up the mask and then I open up the curtains, then bring down the lights. And once they see that, that just blow the customers away. So once they see that, they know the guy behind them is know what he's doing. Uh, on the other hand, uh, when you're working with or for a management who's less inclined the, to to uh, value any kind of uh, aspect of showmanship, and really just they really want you to go out and sell popcorn instead, uh, it, it's probably pretty deadening, and I I doubt that uh, people in that kind of position have much even time to take pride in their work.
The film started, it's well over 100 years of its existence now, and we're kind of on the edge of seeing it disappear from us. But it, of course, pictures, imagery on film started back in the mid-1800s, around 1840 or thereabouts. And, and eventually, eventually flexible stock was developed that would allow an image to be carried on a, a spot so you could put an image on this and it would bend through the machine that's going to run it and you would then wind up with a, a, a image that you could project on a screen. I have mixed emotions about the sort of impending demise of this little product that we know as uh, motion picture film. It's, a, it's, a, it's truly a miraculous product and, and I don't think it's overstating it to say that it's one of the major achievements of the industrial era because I've taken this behind the scenes tour at Eastman Kodak Company uh, to see how this stuff is made. And it's absolutely incredible, the degree of precision and of machinery and the immense uh, um, support structure that's necessary to produce it in the extremely fine quality that we have now. It's a highly precise product. And unfortunately, it's because of that amount of mechanization necessary to make it, as it diminishes from use, the, the amount of film produced is going to become far, far less, and the ability to maintain all that infrastructure is going to disappear. Uh, the best argument for not having digital cinema is it's not archival. Everybody thought it would be, you know, you just make a super duper Blu-ray disc <laughs> and you've got the film, it's preserved forever. Unfortunately, every digital format will be obsolete in the time it takes you to invent something else. And I guess the example is videotape. When it was first invented in the 50s, there have been open, between one and 200 different formats for videotape. And a lot of those can't be played because there are no machines that play that version anymore. Right now, really, the, they say for anything stored digitally, you can keep it for about five years, after which time you need to re-record it or copy it over to another drive of some sort because of the evolution of the technology keeps changing and advancing. So what you did five years ago, you can probably recover, but if you wait 15 years, you might not be able to play it back. So the simple answer to... Uh, film preservation is you have to keep it as film. The thing about storing your images as a piece of film as opposed to on a hard drive is that, that this is an image here and you can see it, this is just a piece of leader, but you can see letters and numbers and you can see images on it. And if anything happens to this, you can still take all these wonderful digital tools that we have and reconstruct it somehow, whereas if it's a hard drive and something's gone, it's toast. You have no idea what's on it and you're virtually impossible to recover it. So this is the advantage to what's called analog storage and that's what is uh, one of the reasons why film storage as a piece of film with an analog image here that you can actually hold up and see is, is uh, strongly recommended. So for the archivist and the person, the pro programmer of old films, you know, the preservers of the, the art form, for them, it's really a big mistake not to have film. There's always an excitement where, whether you start a show, whether it's film or DVD. Because once you go on screen, you know, that's it. There's no going back, you know, so it's your life. You know, what happens, you got a sold out audience and you did something you weren't supposed to and now you got to stop it. Now all that audience who was expecting the movie and a good presentation now sees your, your flub or your, you know, and doesn't make you look good, you know. And actually there is a kind of uh, pride you take in the fact that you can show as much of the film as possible without making uh, the audience see some blank film. I think projectionists, like any other profession, they just want to, you know, do the best they can to show because the filmmaker put a lot of heart and soul into that movie, the actors and stuff like that, and you're the final person to show that, so you got to do the best you can. Yeah, I feel that I do participate in my own little way in, in the show that I run. Everybody who is somehow responsible for part of the image and sound getting to be in front of the audience is, is a, a bit part player in the, in the process of getting this, of this uh, story told. Like, I love to run downstairs and stand in the back of the theater during the opening sequence. You know, it's nice to take 
take pride out of uh, the fact that you personally are responsible for these people um, laughing or crying or or uh, visiting foreign planets, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, yeah, there's a, a pride that goes with it for sure. Uh, we ran films that it was nominated for cate different categories, the shorts, and we run the shorts. Uh, some of the directors of those films, they were actually coming in the booth before their film was uh, screened. And they had a bag with them, a little brown bag, and they set the bag on the table. And when I opened it, the first time I, I seen I opened it, it was a fifth. A fifth of brandy or whatever. And then some of them were real money. They go in their pocket there and they say, oh, that film looks real nice. They slip some money on the table. Then I look at them, these crisp bills, two, three, twenty dollar bills. And they just said, run a good show. They just quietly leave the booth. They are telling you that they they want to, you to give them the best performance that you can give on their show, on their film. Which, you know, me personally, I do it no matter what film it is. I remember the uh, older projectionist told me I'd never have to retire from this. I would always be able to do projection because it didn't revolve uh, physical labor, it just knowing the equipment. So I just thought, that's great, I don't have to retire, I have no plans for the future, I'll always do this. Uh, it turns out management had different plans. As the years went by, uh, our union, uh, the membership uh, went down, people was losing their jobs. It was kind of sad when uh, places I worked at converted. I, I could see they were going to convert to get a digital projector, although sometimes they wouldn't even tell me. And it would just happen without telling me, and then the way I found out was they didn't call me. <laughs> it's total uh, disregard for my many years of loyal service. Uh, I guess they were just assuming that uh, it would be too painful to actually talk to me about it. And now, uh, supposedly, I'm not needed to run digital cinema because uh, they can find anyone who can operate a computer, a laptop, and knows how to move a mouse, he can do it. But, you know, they call themselves projectionists. They're not projectionists. they just a button pusher. But if something happens, they panic. They want somebody, they call on you. I uh, miss all my friends in the Union and those who have died. And uh, although we are loners, you know, uh, we've gone to a lot of meetings over the years. It was a shame. It used to be a really good job. And, you know, I wake up in the morning, get myself ready and get out here and go on to work, go down there and get ahead of time before showtime. And, and we'll sit around, talk, drink coffee, eat rolls. But the uh, fate of the projectionist has really been a problem for me and every other person. I always felt I was more lucky than most because I got the jobs. Even whether people thought I was good or not, I don't know, but I got jobs. It was neat to be part of this era because uh, you saw something before digital took over. The whole idea of doing this at the beginning was First of all, seeing movies, in addition to just seeing the film, I, I realized as I inspected and repaired this film, if I did this right, this film could be run forever and never be damaged. It just had to be run by someone like me who wouldn't make any dumb mistakes. And that was kind of exciting. It made me sense that uh, a projectionist had some real value beyond just showing the movie. We've uh, enjoyed uh uh, running movies over the years and uh, my nostalgia for it is of course uh, we remember the grand 
events that we've done that were film only and will always be film only. I love the job, I love the work. I could have went a little longer, but I hung in there the best I could, you know, until it was over. With. We don't even know really whether people continue even going to movies. We, th we think they will because they need that communal experience of going out to where there's an audience and the, the experience of getting together and laughing together. Uh, but the world's evolving before our eyes. We watch teenagers now, young teenagers, they're communing with their friends, even though they're not even together. They're using their uh, phones and um, doing things by tweets and things, and they feel they're together even though they're not. So will they continue to want to go out to a social experience, or will they m migrate to other kinds of, of uh, entertainment experiences. It's, it's an interesting sociological question, what will happen to the desirability of going out to see uh, an image projected as a collective experience. All of filmmaking over the last 20 years became fully digital. And I thought the last thing would be projecting a film because the cinematographer, the director want to see their movie on film. They'll make at least one print to show to their friends in Bel Air and then I'd be the projectionist. This is my theory, I'd be the last projectionist because somewhere somebody would be making a film on film and they'd want me to show it. Anyway, if I'm gonna be the last projectionist now, it's gonna be have to, have to do it with the computer. Tears you apart 